On the way in, there's a little backdrop um, just off the porch there that you can go and you can get the family picture or whatever. We've just provided that for an opportunity for you to, to just have a little bit more of a backdrop there for those family photos. Again, thank you so much for being with us today. Happy Easter. Let's do it one more time. He is risen. He is risen. Turn your attention to the video, and then Ben will lead us as we prepare our hearts to worship the risen King. Happy Easter. He is risen. I'm so glad you're here worshiping with us, whether you're in the room or online. We are excited to have you. This Wednesday night, April 7th, all of our regular programming for families returns here on campus. Whether you're an adult or a child, we've got something dynamic to offer you, and I encourage you to check out our website and see what different classes and programming is happening here on campus. We also have a ton of amazing connect groups that are meeting. You can go online, read a description of those groups, as well as sign up for them. We're so glad to have you as part of our New Hope family. If you'd like to continue giving generously to God's kingdom, we have four unique ways for you to do that. Number one, you can text to give. Number two, you can give online. Number three, you can mail a paper check to us. Or number four, if you're worshiping on campus, go ahead and drop it in one of those white boxes on either side of the lobby today as you exit. We also would love for you to just take a moment and sign in on our virtual friendship pack. Whether this is your first time worshiping with us or your 101st, we'd love for you to share any updates and prayer requests you have with us. Don't forget that before you leave today, we have a special spot outside the building where you can take an Easter photo with your family. Pastor Mike is bringing us the message, and we're so thrilled to be here in person and worship the risen Savior with you. Happy Easter! Happy Easter. <laughs>
Come, let us worship the Lord together. Let us lift up our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Please join me in the call to worship as we read responsibly. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And behold, there was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he is risen. He said, Let us stand together and praise the Lord. Christ the Lord is risen today.
mighty God, ruler of heaven and earth, O oh, great creator, redeemer, savior, and friend. We come now to worship you today, to sing your praises, to rejoice in the risen Lord. Father, we give you praise this morning for you alone are God. You alone are the only true and living God, infinite in being and perfection, most holy, most wise, most merciful, and yet most just. We praise you this morning for the risen Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We praise you that you from all eternity have set your love on us and have called us to be your people. As we gather to now as your church, we ask that you would lift up our hearts, that we would sing your praises, that we would offer our prayers of confession, that would bring to you ourselves as a living sacrifice. Father, you have done much for us and now we come to return to bring glory and honor to your most holy and perfect name. We do this in the name of our risen Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As the people of God, let's declare today our Earth's Easter Day acclamation as we read responsibly. The day of resurrection, earth tell it out abroad. The Passover of gladness, the Passover of God. From death to life eternal, from earth unto the sky, our Christ has brought us over with hymns of victory. Our hearts be pure from evil, that we may see aright the Lord in rays eternal of resurrection light. Now let the heavens be joyful. Let the earth the song begin. Let the round world keep triumph and all that is therein. Let all things seen and unseen their notes in gladness blend. For Christ the Lord hath risen, our joy that hath no end. We come now to a time of confession, a time of repentance, a time of acknowledging before the Lord our sins. The prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 55, verses six and seven, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Let us pray together our prayer of confession. 
O God, for our redemption, you gave your only Son to suffer death on the cross. By his glorious resurrection, you delivered us from the power of our enemy. Grant that we may die to our sin daily, that we may always live with him in the joy of his resurrection through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now let's take some time to privately within our hearts acknowledge before a holy God our sins and our transgressions, seeking his forgiveness.
and forgiven at the cross. Let us responsibly read our assurance of salvation from 1 Peter 2, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been hanged. Let us stand and glorify our Lord. Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us sing our hymn of preparation, Thine be the glory.
May the words of our mouth, the meditations of our heart, be pleasing and acceptable to you, because you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it is great to be together in the house of the Lord. It's great to have you invite us into your home in the house of the Lord. And, you know, last year, who would have thought that we would have been able to gather again this year? Of course, the year before that, who would have thought that we would not be able to gather? Last year was just a weird year all the way around, wasn't it? I mean, two words, toilet paper. Who would have thought that we would have been nervous about running out of toilet paper? Who would have thought that we couldn't even gather as a church to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, together last April? But, you know, I I really think that if we would have known that this year we would be able to pretty much gather together, not all of us, again, we miss you at home Thanks for tuning in. We look forward to seeing you soon. But who would have thought 12 months ago that we would have been to this place today? Because you see, part of the problem of not knowing the future is not knowing the future. That was profound. (laughs) But part of the problem is that not knowing the future creates a fear for today. Not knowing the future creates an anxiety. If we would have known 12 months ago that we were going to give up one gathered Easter, it might have made it easier than it felt last year. I remember about this time last year, I I don't go to Aldi all that often, but I went there, and um, it was when the pandemic was first catching hold, whatever that is, when when we were still in, in, in the the fearful side of all of that. And I remember going in there and getting caught up and swept up in all of that kind of um, panic, for lack of a better word. And people were buying everything off the shelf. It wasn't just toilet paper that was gone. Everything was going gone. So I got caught up in it, and I just started putting stuff in the basket. I got it home, and my wife, Gina, says, why'd you buy this? Why'd you buy this? It seemed like the right thing to do at the moment, you know? (laughs) And besides, we needed 130 cans of soup. I'm sure we will at some point. It will come in handy at some point. But if I would have known that it was a false panic, if I would have known that three weeks later things would have settled somewhat into a routine, it would have changed everything, wouldn't it? You see, if we know what's coming, it changes the way we react to what is. Does it not? Now, I love Easter And I love to preach the Easter message, but y'all already know where I'm going. I mean, the tomb is empty. Jesus Christ has risen. risen. He is risen from the grave. And so today I I, want to reference that because that is the power. That is the power of Jesus Christ. When he rose from the dead, everything that he said about himself was verified. But today I want to look at the power of Easter, and we're going to be looking at maybe a different passage than you're used to looking at at Easter. If you have your Bibles, it's in 1 Corinthians 15, and I'll put it up on the screen. We'll be able to read it together. But we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15. But before we get there, I want to ask you a question. How do you suppose that a little band of 12 followers and Jesus Christ living in an out-of-the-way country on the fringes of the Roman Empire, really not on the the byway of anything at all, how do you suppose that in 300 years, not only did that following not subside, but it grew to become the dominant world religion? How did that happen? How did Christianity go from being in a backwater little country to becoming the dominant power, the the dominant religion, the dominant truth, the dominant worldview, everything changed as a result of Jesus Christ. How did that happen? Well, there's a, a good book by a guy named Rodney Stark called The Rise of Christianity. And in it, he goes through and he, he sort of looks back on it as a, a historically. And he sees that because the early Christians knew the end of the story, because they knew what was coming, because they were not fearful of what would happen next. 
that they lived in stark contrast to their pagan neighbors. Because of what they knew, because they knew the end of the story, they approached life differently. How did they approach life differently? Number one, when the epidemics hit the urban centers, the cities, the pagans ran away. But the Christians stayed and cared for the sick. And so maybe a pagan who ran away and his parents were, were, were stuck in the city, maybe a Christian came and ministered to them and gave them a cup of cold water and sat with them because they had no fear of death because they knew what was coming. Second way, when they were persecuted or even killed, Christians didn't respond with terror or with warfare. Rather, they died all the while praying for their enemies. When they were thrown to the lions, when they were put into the gladiator rings with no defense at all, just for pure blood sport, rather than fighting back, they prayed for those who were seeking to kill them because they knew the end of the story. And maybe one way that, that I certainly had never thought of, but this was during the, the Peace Romana, Pax Romana. And one thing that was interesting about that, as the peace of Rome spread around the known world, do you know what came down? Borders. Because up until that time, every nation had to defend themselves against their neighbor. Well, now Rome was in control of everybody. And so the borders fell down. And what happened? People in Ethiopia ended up in Jerusalem. People in Gaul ended up in Jerusalem. People that, that came from all over, and they ended up in Rome, and they ended up in Colossae. That's why we have the book of Colossians. They ended up in Thessalonica. That's why we have the book of Thessalonians. All of these people were gathering from all over the place. But the pagans, the pagans saw their God and their country and their world as being very exclusive. So they didn't welcome these people in, but the Christians, they knew the end of the story. They knew that God was the God of everything, that God had called them to redeem through Jesus Christ to tell the story to the ends of the world. And so when the ends of the world came to them, they opened up their fellowship, they opened up their homes, they opened up their lives. And as you read through the New Testament, you see that, yeah, they, they disagreed over some things, but they all agreed that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That's the power of Easter. That's the power of Easter. Why were they so confident? Why were they so confident? Because of the power of the resurrection of Christ. Because of the power of Easter. You see, the power of Easter took away the fear of tomorrow because it gave them certainty of God's future. And it also gave them a picture of what that future was going to be. And we have the opportunity to see that too. I know we've been standing a lot today, but I'm going to ask you to stand in honor of God's Word as we read 1 Corinthians 15 together. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel. I pre we, you can read it with me. Let's start again. <laughs> now, brothers and sisters... I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as a first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. And then we'll pick it up in verse 54. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? 
The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. You may be seated. That's the power of Easter. The power of Easter is that we know what comes. The power of Easter is because the, the tomb was empty, because Jesus Christ defeated death, it verified everything that he had said about himself. The power of Easter is that death has lost its sting. Now, for us, we look at, at those accounts. We look in, and we see Jesus appeared to 500 people at one time. Wow. Jesus appeared to the disciples. Wow. That's, that's really crazy. How did that happen? What's going on there? Those people back then, and, and you may have ever thought of this, but I know that a lot of people have. Those people back then, they must have been so simple-minded to actually believe that. Those people back then, they must have lived in sort of this superstitious society that would allow something like this to actually happen. They would not look at a, we may think, they would not look at a resurrection incredulously. They may not look at a resurrection and go, oh yeah, that could have happened. Sure, sure, we'll go with that. And if that's the way that you think they were back then, you would be 100% wrong. Because, you see, in that day and age, there were two worldviews, two prevailing worldviews. There was the Greco-Roman worldview, and it taught that the body was weak, that the body was bad, and the, the thing that you wanted to do was get away from the body. And so if someone had been released from the body, the last thing in the world that they would, would think would happen would be that the spirit would come back to that body. It was counterintuitive of, of anyone with a Greco-Roman mindset, in other words, anyone who wasn't Jewish, to think in terms of any kind of a resurrection because they just wouldn't have thought of it. It would have been like, why would anybody do that? But the Jewish mindset, they sort of, most, many believed in a resurrection. Remember, there were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the Pharisees believed in a resurrection. The Sadducees didn't, so they were sad, you see? <laughs> Old joke, but you'll remember it. But even those that believed in a resurrection did not believe in a single resurrection. They believed that all of the Jews would be raised up at one time. One single resurrection, that made absolutely no sense to them at all. It would be as if the center for the Michigan State team went on to the final four without the rest of the team. No Michigan State fans in the house, I can tell. <laughs> to have a single resurrection made absolutely no sense in their world view. So you have these two prevailing, prevailing world views going on, and neither one of them makes space for a resurrection. In fact, if you go back and you read the Gospels, when the apostles, when the, the, the first ones, when Mary Magdalene, like we read about this morning, when they showed up at the, at the tomb and it was empty, they had no clue what was going on. They looked at it and they said, what is up with this? This doesn't make any sense. This isn't part of our understanding of the way the world works. And yet, thousands of Christians had a change in worldview overnight. Thousands of Christians in that part of the world, and then they moved on because of the Pax Romana and because of the unction of the Holy Spirit and because of persecution, and they spread that story that, that yes, resurrection is possible, and yes, Jesus Christ himself rose from the dead, and don't take my word for it. Ask one of the 500 that saw him. Don't take my word for it. Ask one of the apostles who put their fingers in his wounds. That's what he says here. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Now, think about this. Paul wrote this as an open letter. Paul wrote this as something that he was sending around to all of the other churches. 
And because there were no borders, it went everywhere. This was a very public proclamation. And what he's saying is, if you don't believe me, go ask Uncle Dimitri. He saw him. If you don't, have, don't believe me, go ask Aunt Mary. She was there. She saw him. She was one of those 500 that saw him. She was one of those ones that, that walked with him. She was one of those ones that sat down and had a meal with him. Don't take my word for it. Talk to your relative. Talk to your friend. Talk to your mother. Talk to your father. People saw him, and then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. You see, the resurrection had no place in their worldview, and guess what? It may have no place in your worldview. For you today, you may be coming, you may be watching, you may be tuning in, and you're saying, oh, such a nice legend, such a nice story, such a nice hope. Hope that works out for you because you have not made room in your worldview for a resurrection. They didn't either, but they just let the facts challenge them. Today, if you have not made room in your heart for a risen Savior, let the facts challenge you. Let the facts of what actually happened engage them with your mind and say, how could this have happened? There's only two explanations. Either it did happen the way it was said, or there's a whole lot of people that got it wrong. But even if it did, don't you want what they had? Don't you want peace? And to be able to pray for others when there's persecution coming at you, you see, we, we don't have lions. We're not being thrown to lions. We have lumps. We go to the doctor, and the doctor says, there's a lump. And we're not sure if it's cancer. We're not sure what to do with it. And we're facing this. Wouldn't you want to face it with a hope beyond today? Wouldn't you want it to be true? Wouldn't you want to face it in the light of and in the name of one who has overcome. You see, there is hope in Easter. There is hope for today. There is hope for tomorrow. There is hope for the future. The risen Christ brings his hope through Easter. You see, those folks then it challenged their worldview. Those folks then, it was incredulous to them, but they got their hope not through wishful thinking. They got their hope through thinking. Have you really engaged the gospel? Have you really taken the gospel seriously? Because you see, because of the gospel, because of the way that we can speak to the things that will come, we can approach those things with confidence. We may not be facing lions. We may not be facing lumps, but we're facing financial problems. We're facing career situations. Maybe your job has dried up. We don't really know how we're going to come out of this pandemic. We really don't know what the future holds. But Paul said it this way. He said, I am convinced that neither layoffs nor broken 401Ks nor cancer nor Alzheimer's nor fears nor death nor life nor angels nor demons neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you see the power of the resurrection? Do you see the power of Easter? It allows us to face anything with confidence because we know the end of the story. Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and because he lives, we live if we put our faith in him. That's the power of Easter. But not only this passage describes the power of Easter, it also describes our future. 
There's so much in these promises, but we're just going to focus on a couple of them this morning. The first thing that, that this passage promises us is a stingless death. A stingless death. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can we get an amen? Come on now. There's a bunch of us here. We can do better than that. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the power of Easter. Now, it's interesting because Paul uses a word there. When he uses that word, the, the, the sting, it's a poisonous sting. Now, I hate all snakes. I'm just kind of wired that way. But I know that there's some good snakes. Somebody was telling me about this one that's down here that's like yellow and it's got red stripes on its back. I think it's called like a yellow rat snake or something like that. If I saw one in my yard, it would be a dead snake. I'm sorry, I'm just snakes are snakes. But it's not the bite that reminds me and shows me that it's not the snake bite that kills. That is a non-venomous, non-poisonous snake. It's not the bite that kills, it's the poison. It's the poison, it's the venom, it's what's in the bite. This word is used for the scorpion's sting. It's not the puncture that kills you, it's the venom that goes in. And Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ being the sinless sacrifice, Jesus Christ the one who is in every way tempted as we are, and yet he is without sin, Hebrews tells us that. Jesus Christ absorbed the venom. Death will come, but it will not kill. Death will come because the venom has been absorbed, has been overcome. There was an ancient guy, his name was Eusebius. And if you followed ancient cultures at all, you know that Eusebius gave us those famous words that Dave Matthews kind of grabbed, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Eusebius was known to not think about the, the, the afterlife. He was a philosopher, and he said, annihilation, when you're dead, you're dead. But I didn't know this. He actually wrote a couple of volumes where he questioned his whole philosophy. And there was a guy, his name was Sir, Sir, Sir Norman Anderson. And he wrote a comment. In other words, he wrote a commentary on what Eusebius was saying because in his heart of hearts, Eusebius did not believe in annihilation. In his heart of hearts, Eusebius knew that there was something beyond life. He knew that there was something after this life. And he says it, um, Anderson says it this way, he says, Eusebius said, if we could be sure that death was annihilation, then there would be no fear of it. For as long as we exist, death is not there. And when it, death does come, we no longer exist. But we cannot be totally sure it is annihilation. What people fear most is not that maybe death is all there is, but that maybe death is not annihilation. That fear is the poison. That fear is the sting. Blaise Pascal said it this way, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, only by God, the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. Do you know him today? Do you know him? Him who has absorbed the sting of death. Death will come unless Jesus comes first, but there is death and then there is the sting of death. And Jesus Christ has absorbed the sting of death. He has, he has annihilated the poison of death and he is the only one who has and the only one who can. Have you put your trust in him today? Have you realized the power of Easter? Francis Chan said it this way. In John 3, 17, we read that Jesus didn't come to condemn the world because the world was already condemned. That's why there are no atheists in foxholes. It's absolutely terrifying. 
that fear of death, that's the fear of judgment. That's the sting. And as Paul said, the sting of death is the law. The sting of death is sin. But praise be to Jesus Christ, he has defeated that. It's like a receipt. Easter is like a receipt. You ever go to Costco and try to get out without a receipt? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's when, they, that, that's when that little person there calls security and the bouncers show up, right? A receipt shows that something's been paid for. If you don't have the receipt, you can't show that it's been paid for. Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord, is our receipt that death has been swallowed up in victory. If Satan accuses you, say, you look at that empty tomb. My debt has been paid, and it has been paid in full. When fears come against us about what's coming after this life, you look at that empty tomb and you say, my debt has been paid in full by the blood and the grace and the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Now that ought to get an amen. Come on, people. You see, it's a receipt. But it's only a receipt if you will accept it. In the garden, Peter, the apostle Peter, the impetuous one, he had a sword. And when they came to arrest Jesus, he took out that sword and he whacked off a guy's ear. So specific, so clear, poor guy couldn't have worn a mask, you know? <laughs> but he cut off his ear. And Jesus, the great healer, the great physician, reaches down, picks up the ear, and puts it back on the guy's head and heals him right there. And he says, Peter, I didn't come to bring judgment. I came to bear judgment. Peter, I didn't come to wield the sword. I came to receive the sword for you and for me to pay that receipt so that if fear of what comes next approaches us, we can say that's been paid for. So that if fear of illness, fear of anything, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Easter is the receipt. Do you know the power of Easter? Do you know the power of having that receipt with your name written on it? You can know it today. Open your heart to Jesus and say, Lord, I want this. This is true. This is not legend. This is not folklore. This is the power of God. Because you see, not only did, sin, did, did death lose its sting, but it was swallowed up. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Later on today, you might have lunch and you might get dessert and somebody's going to put a piece of pie or maybe a piece of cake or maybe some of those sickeningly sweet peeps right in front of you. And at that point, you got two choices. You can throw it away or you can eat it. And when you eat it, it becomes a part. When you eat it, it becomes part of your energy. It becomes part of your self. But that's another whole story. It becomes a part of you because you have swallowed it up. It doesn't go away. It becomes part of your story, part of your energy, part of who you are. Death has been swallowed up in victory. It's not been ignored. It's not pushed aside. It's been swallowed up. Have you ever noticed when you read the Gospels, when Jesus appears, Thomas puts his hands in Christ's wounds. When Jesus appears, his wounds are still there. Why? because they're part of his testimony, because the thing that this world wanted to bring pain and death and destruction has been swallowed up. It has become part of the story. It has been given. In Revelation, it says, they were saved by the blood of the Lamb and the word of of the testimony. The gospel says that anything that we have been through, anything that we suffer, anything that we have, anything is used by him for our glory, for his glory, for his purposes. 
You see, death wasn't just pushed aside. <laughs> death was swallowed up in victory. At the cross on Easter morning when he rose from that grave, when he rose and walked out of that tomb, he showed the power of Easter. And he is the only one who could because he alone is able to open the seal. Let me ask you, has he opened the seal in your heart? Have you made room for him? Have you enjoyed the power of Easter? Can you look forward to the future without fear? If so, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the truth of the gospel. Thank you, Lord, that, that you appeared to so many folks because we, we, we just can't deny that. Father, thank you for your grace, for your mercy. Thank you for the power of Easter. And Father, I pray that if someone today has not yet received that receipt and they are still dealing with fears of what will happen, dealing with fears of, of even what tomorrow might bring, Father, we pray that you would give them the strength, that you would give them the, the Easter hope, that you would remind them that the power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and active in those who believe. And so, Father, by your spirit, by your grace, by your mercy, would you show us the risen Savior? To him alone be all glory and honor and praise forever. Amen and amen. Let's stand together and sing our closing hymn. my life, my soul, my all. Receive the benediction. And now may the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen.